Thank you so much for having me come speak with you today and for being here to listen to me speak. And I say that to both those of you who are here because you thought the title was intriguing enough to learn what I had to say, and those for who uh, that made him actually a little apprehensive <laughs> because of the title, but wanted to give it a chance. For better or for worse, despite the title, I won't actually be berating everyone today for being lazy. Lazy isn't even the best word for it, but it was the best one, you know, to put on a title, I guess. Uh, the Germans probably have a better word for exactly what I mean here, but I don't speak German. And side note, if you do speak German and there is a word for what I mean, please let me know. What I do mean is this. There are a lot of hard problems in computer science, in scaling apps, in working together you know, with other people and other developers and shipping code into production. I get it. I've been on lots of sides of that aisle. And I've spent time, you know, running product and engineering groups for proprietary healthcare software companies. Uh, I've been a director of DevOps for a contractor to the US federal government. I've spent time at GitLab with our customers, helping them ship better software faster. So I can appreciate that there are a lot of hard problems when it comes to doing that, to shipping better software faster. At the same time though, there are many, many, many solved problems in computer science. Unless you have, you know, very advanced use cases, most of us are not writing machine code or, you know, creating our own processor or doing really low level memory management. Those are solved problems that we, you know, take for granted. Well, another problem that is solved is how to build accessible and inclusive software. But even though there are solutions, they are much less likely to be adopted <clears throat> than you know the latest JavaScript framework. And that's what I wanna talk to you about today. I wanna to talk about a few stories around accessibility and inclusion, and then talk about how many of these are solved problems. And in the end, I hope I can encourage you to reevaluate and understand your own designs and software and build a better world where everyone can contribute. I'll introduce myself in detail a little more later, but I wanna start with a personal story about my name, specifically my last name. My last name is O'Leary. It stands for Son of Leary back in the time where you know there were feudal lords in Ireland. Um, if there's still some lordship out there that I'm due, I I'm unaware of it. My family's been in the United States for some time. It's fun to spell this on the phone for people, right? Capital L, capital O, apostrophe, then capital L, then a lowercase E-A-R-Y. And that's just with humans. Anyone who's been in programming for, you know, a little while or has ever written anything in like a SQL database or has read XKCD 327 about poor little Bobby Tables knows that it's a problem for computers too. And the problem is that apostrophe, right? So you can call it a single quotation mark or you know sometimes it's a single curly quotation mark. Uh, it goes by many names and many Unicode characters. And actually it can cause a real problem for folks who are using a database, right? Or you know, it, you might even get my favorite version of my name when you make you know rendering uh, stuff safe for HTML. We'll get this. Yeah, it's simultaneously my favorite and my least favorite version of my last name. And it really, you know, I get it. SQL injections are scary. Someone putting JavaScript into an input and getting it to run on someone else's computer, very scary. But there are ways to handle this much better than many websites do today. The typical response is to do some client-side evaluation and just reject things that we don't like. But that's also the lazy way. There are a lot of name variations out there. And programmers believe a lot of falsehoods about people's names. That people only have one full name, that names are case sensitive or that they're case insensitive, or that people's names don't change, or that they're only in ASCII characters, or one character set and lots of other things that are just not true around the world. So if instead of working to understand the you know, differences that exist and try their best to account for all of them, they just restrict name fields to fit into the box that they've decided is acceptable. But there's a problem with that. It can quite literally invalidate a person's personhood, especially given that they then write a warning back to me, which is, 
your last name's invalid. Well, that's about as invalidating as you can get, I think, right? It's literally saying it's invalid. My last name isn't invalid. Maybe it's invalid for your form, but that's because you were too lazy to escape characters that you didn't expect. And you just put arbitrary restrictions on names. And this doesn't just happen with no name or small websites and apps. First of all, the state I live in in the US, Maryland, I was born there. My birth certificate shows an apostrophe in O'Leary. But my license to drive has no apostrophe. But my passport from the US federal government has an apostrophe. My social security card, well, actually I don't know. I didn't pull it out for this talk. And I've probably already given away a little too much detail for anyone trying to steal my identity. But what even is my legal name? I, I don't know if I know the answer to that. But, you know, I do know that if you try to steal my identity, good luck working with all the different major businesses you want to mess around with, probably. The credit agencies, the Red Cross, Marriott's Rewards Program, Best Buy. None of these major organizations with budgets in the millions and billions of dollars can figure out how do I add a slash before an apostrophe so that I can escape it and put it in a SQL database. So, you know, they, they, they just don't deal with it. They just let my name be whatever they want it to be. Getting onto the hotel Wi-Fi with a, your last name and room number is always a new adventure every time. There's lots of other people that have unique names that can give systems a lot of trouble. So, you know, some folks might try to implement community guidelines. Um, they might have a different order for surnames and given names and lots of other name diversity that exists that we talked about. It can also impact who, you know, people who character wise have a normal name, but the platform decided that name's invalid, right? There's lots of people in the world with two character surnames. Uh, don't put a limit, arbitrary limit on the size of the surname. And when you're implementing those community guidelines, sometimes automated is not the way to go. It can lead to some pretty bad experiences for folks who probably don't love attention being called to the other meanings of their names. If you just design software with a bunch of folks named John and Jane Smith, there's not gonna be a lot of thought around the diversity of names. My father has just given up with this fight. He doesn't even try to add the apostrophe anymore to any online form. He's just accepted that the world isn't made for him. Being somehow even more stubborn than he is and being left-handed and used to the world not being made for me, has me still fighting for this and calling it out when I see it. Neither of those things should have to happen though, right? With inclusion at the design phase, when we're building those user stories, we can prevent these kinds of things from happening to begin with. And honestly, I've spent a lot of time on it because it impacts me personally, but it's not even that big of a deal. I understand it. I can get around it. I could even, you know, give up like my dad did and go about my life. But it doesn't start and end with names, unfortunately. Things can get much, much worse. For example, gender or sex on a form, right? The lazy way to put this, to do this is to put man, woman, other, or female, male, other. First of all, you gotta learn the difference between sex and gender and collect the one you're really looking for. Hint, if it's not medical software, you probably just want gender. And do you really need it at all, actually? Think about it. Second of all, one of my best friends is non-binary. It can be tough to have that as a gender identity. A lot of the world doesn't get it. In fact, as a cis male, I don't completely get it. But I do know that my friend isn't an other. I know that my friend doesn't want to be an othered by other people. So why would a website lazily make them say, I am other? It's honestly completely unacceptable. And the problem of identity is extremely pervasive. It impacts many people across the globe. A professor was talking with a colleague who was struggling with Zoom and the, the virtual background, couldn't get it to work. Does anyone have any guesses about what's happening here? It's exactly what you think. The algorithm being used for face detection works great for people like me bald white dudes, but it can also literally erase black faces. Deciding that either the wall behind him or the globe, well, that must be the face. 
And so it just erases his. I originally didn't see this thread online on my computer. I saw it in Twitter's mobile app. And in reporting this problem with face detection for people of color, Colin found there was another problem he hadn't thought of. Because when he shared it to Twitter, you can see here, there was a problem that was very similar. No matter how he uploaded the side-by-side -side comparison, Twitter on mobile would show his face and not his colleagues. Twitter was using some sort of smart cropping algorithm to try and find what's important in this picture. And it was choosing the white face over the black face as more important every time. Now, I have to add here that Twitter actually saw this post, commented on it, and have actually fixed it. And they fixed it the easy way. They disabled the cropping and automatic fitting on mobile and elsewhere. But the fact that they fixed it this way is actually very, very telling for all of us. Getting this right, an algorithm that isn't biased, you know, based on what the inputs that we give it are, was so hard that not even Twitter, with its vast team of engineers and really smart people, I know a lot of really smart people who work at Twitter, even they decided to fix it the easy way. They decided it was not possible to do the cropping right with an algorithm. So they just don't crop them anymore. Again, even with this, I can hear some people saying, it's not that big of a deal. So some edge cases exist, people with names that don't fit into two nice little boxes of ASCII characters, or, okay, but we've learned, you know, Twitter fixed it, they fixed their cropping problem. They tried something and, and they iterated to a fix. What's, what's the big deal? Is anyone actually being hurt here? Well, let me tell you one more story. On a Thursday afternoon in January of 2020, Robert Julian Borkak Williams was in his office and he got a phone call. And he assumed it was a prank. It was the Detroit Police Department calling, telling him to come to the station so that he could be arrested. He ignored it. I probably would have assumed it was a joke too. Just an hour later, as he's arriving home uh, to his house in suburban Detroit, a police car pulls up behind him. They pull him out, handcuff him on his front lawn in front of his family. They didn't give any reason or details beyond a warrant that had his picture on it, and it had a grand, larcen grand larceny printed on it. When his wife asked for more information, or you know where they were taking him, the officer literally said to her, Google it. Mr. Williams was fingerprinted, had his DNA and mugshot taken, put in jail overnight. The next day, the detectives came to meet with him and asked what he knew about a robbery of a jewelry store that had happened months before. And he was asked, when was the last time you were in the store? Mr. Williams said he did check out the store when it first opened four years prior to the robbery. The detective slid a piece of paper across the table. In the picture was a heavy set man in the store looking at the watch display. That person then later stole $3,800 worth of jewelry and watches. Is that you? asked one of the detectives. Mr. Williams held up the picture next to his own face. No, this is not me. The picture was clearly not Mr. Williams. So what happened here? The Detroit Police Department had spent $5.5 million on a facial recognition system from DataWorks Plus, which incorporates technology from NEC and Rank 1 Computing to run facial recognition against suspects' images. The police department used a still image from the security uh, store's security footage that was provided by the store's loss prevention personnel to find a suspect among all of the Michigan State driver's license photos. A federal study in 2019, however, showed that the algorithms from both of those companies showed extreme bias, misidentifying African-American and Asian faces 10 to 100 times more often than Caucasian ones. Now, the output of that system isn't meant to be evidence. In fact, it says on top, this document is not a positive identification. Uh, it's bold capital letters at the top. It says it's a negative, it's an investigative lead only and is not probable cause for arrest. But what the officers did next is they took Mr. Williams' image, added it to a photo lineup with five other individuals, showed it to that same loss prevention person who had provided the video to them, and that person pointed to Mr. Williams. And on that basis alone, 
Mr. Williams was arrested and jailed. Two weeks after his arrest, Mr. Williams took a vacation day from work and appeared in court in Wayne County for his arraignment. The state's prosecutor moved to dismiss the case and without prejudice, meaning Mr. Williams could not later be charged again for this crime. Because since then, Mr. Williams figured out what he was doing <laughs> the night of the shoplifting. He was driving home from work and actually posted a video of his, to his Instagram with one of his favorite songs on the radio. He had a rock solid documented alibi, but the Detroit police didn't bother to check into that. My name is, a, as I said, at least partially, <laughs> is Brendan O'Leary. I'm a developer evangelist at GitLab, and I wanna talk about how we design our systems and our software, and about how we can work together to solve these kinds of problems. We know a lot as software engineers, and we know what works and what doesn't. If we're able to apply that energy towards inclusion and accessibility in our designs and in our software, I'm confident that we can make the entire world more inclusive, more accessible. So that's what I wanna to touch on. First, what's the current state? Where are we? Well, we're built, are we building inclusive, accessible software? That doesn't just benefit those who it's directly aimed at. Helping, it benefits everyone, hurts nobody. It's complicated by the fact that accessibility or inclusion is often considered as an afterthought. We design software to scratch our own itches and our own itches are inherently biased to the life experiences we've had. So if that's true, how can we build a inclusivity into our designs. What can we do to overcome the fact that we can't change who we are and we can't really walk in someone else's shoes? Well, that old cliche has a bunch of truth to it. You have to bring attention, focus, empathy, and action to bear on the problem and leverage existing resources. Like I said at the beginning, these are problems that have solutions. You just need to seek them out intentionally. It's not a small portion of people that are impacted by this. I live in the USA, in North America, and so I have that perspective on the world. But we know both intellectually and with data that the world is much, much wider, much more diverse place. In fact, unless you live in Asia, you don't live with the majority of people. And regardless of where you live, you ex your experiences are going to be different from someone who lives on the other side of the globe, or even just the other side of the street. The latest numbers from the WHO show that over a billion people have a disability of some sort, which might mean that they use and operate your software in a way that's much different than how you, or with different tools than you use to operate that software. In addition, 17% of people are considered to be neurodivergent which includes things like autism, dyslexia, ADHD, and OCD. And if you're neurotypical, you might not understand the kind of impact that design, color, organization, and other things might have on someone who is neurodivergent interacting with your application. And when it comes to race, where you can have a huge impact on how you view issues of race and racial inequality, I don't want to you know, pick on San Francisco or San Franciscans here, but since a lot of the apps we use every day are designed and coded in and around San Francisco, I think it's relevant as a case study. The breakdown of race in San Francisco isn't even representative of the rest of the United States, much less the rest of the world. This means if you live there and you're building software there, you have to actively work to understand how race can impact what you're building. And again, that's true no matter where you are or where you live. Your environment and experiences are going to naturally shape your view on the world. And that's okay. That's positive. But we have to work to understand how others might see the world. And we have to include them in the design of software to ensure that we are building with and for everyone. And I want to pause there and, and talk about what I mean about with versus four, building with everyone versus for everyone. 
So when we're talking about building for everyone, well, in the United States, we have laws around making spaces accessible to people who may need to use a wheelchair or something like it to get around. These laws ensure that we are building, literally, for everyone. If there's stairs to the front door of a building, you have to also build a ramp somewhere so that folks in wheelchairs can access that building as well. But how is that different than building with everyone? Well, if I required a wheelchair to move around, I know I'd rather go in the front door rather than some other entrance. So if we're building with people and those who are differently abled, we might decide, you know what? Let's make the door a single front door, single even surface so that anyone can go through the front door. Letting everyone use that front door is how it's like to build with everyone rather than just for everyone. That's universal or inclusive design. So great, let's say you're on board, now what? How do we build accessibility and inclusiveness into our design and build processes so that we can ensure we're fully realizing the benefits of building with everyone? Well, let's first go back to first principles. Any designer can tell you that the, one of the first principles of design is empathy. The ability to understand and share in the feelings of others is critical to any design. So we have to be sure that empathy, that empathy is for everyone. Don't just let it be empathy in the sense of, well, as a product manager, I want to be able to blah, blah, blah. Build, build real empathy that includes the feelings and desires of a diverse group of people and brings their perspectives directly into your design processes. That doesn't mean making one thing that works for all people. People are different and that's okay. That diversity makes us stronger. Don't try and design a one size fits all solution. Design a solution that brings all of the diverse ways that people are going to participate in using and experiencing that software or that app. That will instill in you and in your users, a sense of belonging that isn't just good for humanity, it's good for business too. To build inclusion in, you have to make it required. Just like any other design requirement, make inclusion and accessibility a hard requirement, not a nice to have that you end up just putting in the backlog. You also have to learn, both yourself and if you're a leader, you have to make room and time for your team to learn. There's a lot of amazing resources out there. I have a link to some of them on buildinclusive.com. But if you're going, if you're good at doing your own research, uh, you don't have to do that. You can just dedicate the time to it and you'll be able to do it. I also can't recommend enough building in the open. At GitLab, we're not only an open source project, but we're an open company. Building in the open can you know, feel really scary or um, you know, odd and unnatural at first. But trust me, the more you allow your feedback and input into your system, the better the outcome. Now, I could do a whole presentation just on this. So for now, you'll just have to trust me. And lastly, implementation matters. One of my favorite lines from the musical Into the Woods comes from Red Riding Hood after she realizes what the wolf is really up to. He wants to eat her and her grandmother. She sings about how she was able to, he was able to trick her because he seems so nice. Singing about what she learns, she then sums it up really simply. Nice is different than good. Having the intention to be inclusive is nice, but actually following through with implementation is what's good. And what does that look like? Well, as a web developer myself, let's talk a little bit about the web. Images with descriptions on them means that everyone can access the information in those images, even if they can't see well, or maybe can't see at all. If you add captions to your audio, everyone can have access to what's being said, even if they can't hear well or can't hear at all. 
If your site works well and can be navigated with voice recognition, then everyone can interact with it, even if they can't use a, a keyboard or a mouse very well. And speaking of navigation, if it's consistent, well-framed, and well-framed, then everyone can interact with it, even if they have you know, intellectual disabilities or might have memory issues or impairments. Outside of the web, all digital assets should be thought of under these lights, right? Games, books, etc. And it's especially important when designing hardware. I understand that it can be intimidating. It's a lot to take on. So what can you do today or tomorrow when you go back to work after the conference? Well, I want to share a few tips here. There's a lot of small steps you can take to start that journey. Map out your application. Look at each small detail and, you know, a sequence of interactions. What are the barriers that exist for different groups of people at those various stages? Then flip it around and see how can we make those interactions more inclusive. You could find a free online course. Uh, you know, there's Google Web Design courses, some advanced courses on EDX and Udacity. If you're building for the web, you could also use extensions on your browser to gauge accessibility. And remember to design with and including diverse communities, not for them. You can foster that belonging through representation and you can establish accountability on day one. Make the decision that you're going to require all this. And uh, just a little thing, if you're a GitLab user, free or otherwise, and of course I hope that you are, uh, you can add automated web accessibility testing to your GitLab CI/CD pipeline with just these six lines of YAML. Once you add that, you'll automatically get accessibility testing on every merge request. And if you use rev review apps, you can then preview the changes and you can see how um, over time your app is either getting more or less accessible. This is a small step that you can take today to start the process of including it in your development processes. Uh, you can visit uh, brendan.fyi slash A11Y docs for the full documentation on how to use this. And if you're not a GitLab user, uh, that's okay. I mean, you should switch, but that's a different talk. But you can still leverage the same thing because it's built around open source accessibility tools. Here we see the detailed code that's kind of behind that included file we had in the last slide. You can see it's a public Docker image that we use, and you can see the commands we're running against it. And we run it against those URLs that we specified. Hopefully, even if you don't use GitLab, you should. Sorry, I have to say that just one more time for the marketing folks to be happy. You can add accessibility testing to your development processes, regardless of the tools you use, with this. And for the detailed code here, you can visit brendan.fyi slash A11Y testing. Taking even some small steps today can really help. Iteration over time and small changes made today will add up. Obviously, we can't end racism just by stopping one act of violence against a black person or an Asian person or another person of color. Just like that, we can't stop all the bias or exclusionary design from entering our designs just by focusing on you know, the color of the buttons. But if everyone in your organization chooses to be in the group of people who try to make people feel more included, and everyone in your development process takes responsibility for creating inclusive technology, we can make the world a more inclusive and accessible place. Thank you again so much for having me and for listening to me today. I hope that you got at least some of you, I hope that I got at least some of you thinking about ways you can make your software more inclusive. If you have questions, I'll be in the chat afterwards to talk more about your thoughts, and I'd love to hear your feedback. After the conference, uh, the best way to get in touch with me is typically through Twitter. I'm at O'Leary Crew, and my DMs are open. I also do have an email address that I sometimes even check, so that's here too. To view these slides, the resources I mentioned in this talk, as well as a lot of other resources that I'm trying to gather, please visit buildinclusive.com. 
I'd also love your feedback on that site. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot of great resources that we could add there. Thanks and stay safe.